From Rosa Luxemburg and Leon Trotsky, to Noam Chomsky and Ian Kuczynski, Marxism-Leninism has had a plethora of critics. Among some criticisms is the label Red Fascist, used against the ideology to imply that it is only associated with the left in name and aesthetic, rather than the fundamental principles and actions that define MLs. Having done the video on whether or not the US could be considered fascist, even George Orwell strangely acknowledged the difficulty in defining fascism, but disliked its reduction to a swear word regardless. With his quote in mind, let's take a look into the validity of labeling MLs as red fascists. Before beginning, I must bring up that I have been a Marxist-Leninist for a little over a year, and with a channel that's four plus years old, it can be concluded that I've instead been just a Marxist for the other three plus years. It's this history, and with ML friends that I've made, that have allowed me a certain level of nuance I have to appreciate. By the end of this video, I hope to not just open an insightful discussion, but to be seen by both sides as above the black and white spectrum of authority versus liberty, prevalent among the online left. The ideology has its origins as the state ideology of the Soviet Union, that has been specifically coined by its first general secretary, Joseph Stalin. It's the ideology most people refer to when they think of communism, no doubt from the Soviet Union's influence across the world and among the many socialist countries at the time. It is here where a common divergence exists between communists, and where the argument that wasn't real communism possibly stems from. Like Marxism, what I may call Leninism for short, shares Marx's critique of capitalism, his belief in surplus value being something exploited from the working class, the recognition of conflict theory between social classes, and his method of analysis we now call dialectical materialism. Lenin contributed to the definition of the state as a tool and dictatorship of the capitalist class that exists to subvert the workers and maintain capitalism, as well as the defining of socialism as a transitionary state before communism, rather than the interchangeable word it was with communism. A Leninist's most relevant main idea is vanguardism, this idea that the first class conscious workers are given the responsibility of forming a political party called the Vanguard Party, that is to lead the rest of the working class towards a revolution and overthrow of the capitalist state. Many follow that the members of the Vanguard Party become part of the new state that mimics the role of the capitalist state, but against the capitalist class among other reactionary remnants. Without competition to the working class, the society will, in theory, achieve classlessness and be closer to achieving communism. As the Vanguard Party is to guide the working class, this socialism in one country is to make world socialism, with the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is the dominance of the working class, combined with the constraints of democratic centralism, that is the anti-factualist and debate-friendly governing unit that requires voluntary agreement to achieve progress will allow the state to interpret the necessary adjustments towards the other goals of a moneyless and stateless society. This idea of red fascism might come from the common comparison of the Soviet Union and Stalin to Nazi Germany and Hitler. The Nazis were predated by a history of social stigma against Jewish people and the conditions of business ownership, seemingly prevalent among a lineage of Jews since feudal times of being excluded from guilds and society. This led to people like Gottfried Feder to theorize on things like Rafendis Kapital, also known as Jewish finance capitalism, that shall be purified into a productive capitalism, which eventually inspired Adolf Hitler. What followed was systemic repression and violence against the Jews, among other minorities like Slavs, Romani, Gays, and the Disabled, as well as the privatization of smaller businesses, which included his constructing state-owned industries and social programs formed under Kaiser Wilhelm II. The Soviets, on the other hand, came after a history of intense oppression by the Tsar, like the 1905 Bloody Sunday Massacre, among other instances of refused negotiations with its people. Violence was so far directed against the Tsar, his white army, and all who reinforced the state institution. A large number of Tsarist supporters were the less literate and rurally located peasantry, the succession of the Bolshevik Revolution and defeat of the Tsardom left behind the peasants, which only further fed into a literal class conflict between workers and peasants. The already war-torn Tsarist Russia was succeeded by a Soviet Russia, which instead of privatization, resulted in the opposite. The takeover was simple. Workers and soldiers seized the Winter Palace among telephone, telegraph, and government offices. The Congress of Soviet Workers and Soldiers Deputies, already in session, 
declared itself the government on November 7, 1917. It quickly passed three decrees on peace, land, and state power. The peace decree proposed to all warring governments the First World War was on to negotiate peace. The decree on land made all land state property, in which working class peasants had users' rights. The decree on state power gave all power to the Soviets. From all parts of the country, telegrams announced the electing of local Soviets. Peasant Soviets held a congress and joined the new government which called itself a Soviet Republic. Lenin later introduced the new economic policy that permitted all kinds of production, socialist, cooperative, and even capitalist. The state kept the mines, railways, and heavy industries, all badly ruined, but private ownership continued in small industries, shops, and farms for the time. This coming from Anna Strong, a Marxist journalist who moved to Russia to provide relief aid during the Volga famine at the time of this quote. While ideologically and economically different, one could still try to argue that both the Nazis and Soviets started antagonisms against certain people that led to systemic violence, as it isn't the white army soldiers nor Tsarist nobles that critics of the Leninists criticize, instead alluding to what many call the Holodomor and its victims of genocide. With genocides, most lack a significant number of historians denying it, but if the Holodomor is a genocide, then it is also an exception with this observation. With many historians, and even a sizable amount from the West, denying or believing alternatives to the mainstream idea of the Holodomor as a planned genocide. Instead of analyzing many historians on both sides and trying to differentiate the revisionists from the accurate, I think the next best thing is to summarize the situation and include the perspectives of both sides. It's complicated, begins public historian Kochevnik, who worked in international development in the former Soviet Union. It helps to first review what the legal definition of genocide is. From the 1948 UN Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, there is a heavy focus on intent. For an act to qualify as genocide as opposed to merely a crime against humanity, there has to be an intention to wipe out a national, ethnic, religious, racial group. There are arguments that this bar largely set by the Holocaust is too high, and that the 1948 UN language was determined with Soviet input. Even though Raphael Lemkin, who coined the phrase, specifically had the deaths of Ukrainians in mind. Also important to note differing concepts of genocide, such as cultural genocide. An excellent literary review in 2015 by Olga Andrewski in East West, a journal of Ukrainian studies on the historiography of studying the Holodomor, she notes that the conclusions of James Mace's commission report to U.S. Congress in 1988 hold up well with the position of most Ukrainian presidents except for Yanukovych and historians, favoring official commemoration of the Holodomor as a planned genocide. Andrewski notes that while some prominent Ukrainian historians, such as Valery Sodatenko, dispute the use of the term genocide, the debate is largely around intent. Open and shut? Not so. The perspective from Russian and Soviet historians don't differ drastically from the Holodomor historians on the number of victims or the centrality of government policies nor deny that Ukraine suffered heavily, but their context and point of view differ tremendously from Ukrainian Holodomor historians in that they note the 1931-1933 famine wasn't limited to Ukraine, but also the Russian Central Black Earth region, Volga Valley, North Caucasus, and Kazakhstan. While most famine victims were in Ukraine, some 3.5 million of 33 million, some 5 to 7 million died from famine across the Union, at least 10 million people across the Union suffered severe malnutrition and starvation without dying. Stephen Kotkin very clearly states, there was no Ukrainian famine. The famine was Soviet. Other factors tend to mitigate the idea that the Holodomor was planned to specifically wipe out Ukrainians as a people. The Ukrainian borders with Russia were sealed, but in the same period where internal passports were introduced across the USSR. Stephen Wheatcroft and Michael Elman are two historians worth mentioning here, notably because they had a public debate about a decade ago around how much Stalin knew and intended consequences during the famine. Despite their disagreements, do agree that the famine wasn't an engineered attempt to deliberately cause mass deaths, but an attempt to extract grain reserves from the peasantry for foreign export and for feeding urban industrial workers. Elman comes down on the position that the famine isn't a genocide according to the UN definition, but is in a more relaxed definition. Specifically, he cites the de of the Kuban region in the North Caucasus 
as an example of cultural genocide. But even here, notes that while under a relaxed definition, we see plenty of other states, such as the UK, US, Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain, similarly guilty of genocides, depressingly common and not unique to the Soviet experience. This condition of a class conflict between the peasants and working class, I believe, plays a larger role in the thoughts and actions of those involved in the Soviet Union's functions than any one specific national, ethnic, religious, or racial group, which is at best to me a classless, anti-nationalist, and perhaps even inconsiderately motivated oppression. When Lenin died and Stalin eventually became the General Secretary of the Union, industrialization increased even further, as noted from one of his first speeches to the people since being in his position. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make up this gap in 10 years, or the enemy will crush us. I truly wonder if much would have been different under Lenin, who was almost as uncompromising as Stalin, and Trotsky, who arguably despised the peasantry more than either. Especially considering the popular Marxist belief at the time, supporting the idea that socialism needed to happen in a developed capitalist nation, unlike the conditions of a backward semi-feudalist Russian Tsardom, which inspired Stalin to eventually come up with the theory of socialism in own country, while one could find irony in a former group of revolutionaries now government, putting down rebellious peasant activity within the new state. None of this compares to the level of fascists and Nazis that uphold the worst their ideologies have done, or deny them and wish they happened anyway. The point being that a Marxist-Leninist does not want famines or genocides, whereas many historians like Pierre vidal noquet and Matthias Kunzo argued every denial of the Holocaust contains an appeal to repeat it. Despite the fact of Fidel Castro's homophobia, Che Guevara's early homophobia, or accusations and sources of anti-Semitism within the Soviet Union, many Leninists are quick to discuss Castro's later regret to being homophobic, Cuba's rise in support of LGBT laws, Che's later journaling of being supportive, and the fact that the killing of anti-Semites is included in the number of deaths in the Black Book of Communism. Not to mention the level of engagement by the Soviet Union, who seized Berlin and played what many witnesses of the war considered the most active role. Personally, I've met many people who criticized Stalin in the USSR's overall passing of homophobic laws, including communities with rules protecting minorities and parties that emphasize minority rights. The Soviet Union was also a global entity that had decades of respect and positive interaction with other groups, like ethnic Muslim, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Slavic, and even Israeli people. Even though the aforementioned Anna Strong, who even met with Stalin a few times and interviewed Mao Zedong, described power creep in tendencies and stricter centralization over Stalin's time, with hard stops against counter-revolutionaries, in a way of taking in the collective to make popular decisions, Marxist-Leninists, including my past self, would acknowledge Stalin's inability to be relieved from his duties by the party congress on three to four occasions, in addition to the elections that kept Stalin in this position. A clear trend here is that while I might have some arguments or share certain contexts, I can still acknowledge the worst case scenarios of certain aspects that many critics dislike about Leninists, and defend them by the argument that their intentions and wishes matter more than the true histories of a past they've not witnessed. One could surely consider that the successful outcome of Leninists would be better than the worst portrayals of socialist examples. To even the harshest critics of top-down structures might wonder if knowledge of the past would allow for a longer session of the better intended, and that a vanguardist revolution is at least democratic in the sense that it requires the people to be successful. The bottom line is that many Marxist-Leninists are well-intending individuals who are capable of debating in good faith, maintaining friendly communities, and rejecting any promotion of genocides. People like Vosch are unfair to Leninists, who encourage dismissive labels that do nothing but discourage debate and critical thought. To call one a red fascist is to be lazy. Surely the stereotypes of leftist infighting can be calmed with an emphasis on those anti-dogmatic principles, and make the possibility of left unity more considerable. In the end, this conclusion is my conclusion. What do you think? Should we call MLs Red Fascists? If you like this video or learned something new, leave a like. If you didn't, then leave a dislike. Subscribe for more content like this.